Coco. And this morning, we're going to be talking about a very serious topic, a topic that affects women. So our focus is women this morning. Of course, the brothers need to listen because it, it also has to do with you. So the topic is some women enable the bad behaviors of men. Some women in their actions or in their, in their inaction enable the bad behavior of men. Right, so this is what we're going to be talking about and I want us to be very honest with ourselves. So the question following that is each woman, each sister must ask herself, am I an enabler? Am I in my action or in my lack of action enabling the bad behavior of the men in my life? And these men could be my spouse, my brother, my son, my father, my grandfather, because there are things that we do as women that put other women at risk. There are things that we do or things that we neglect to do as women that put other women and, and young girls at risk. And this is what we're talking about this morning. So let us, for some background, let's, let us define the words that we're throwing out there. So the, the key word here being enabler. The word enabler. Plug it there. Who is an enabler and what, what kind of actions um, enable bad behavior? Right? So by definition, the enabler is someone who um, allows self-destructive patterns of behavior to continue. So you might have someone in your life who is involved in self-destructive behavior or behavior that destroys another person. And you allow this, this person to continue in those actions because you either neglect to bring it to their attention or bring it to the attention of someone who is in the position to stop the behavior, whether it's a criminal behavior or it's just a, a socially unacceptable behavior, right? It's similar to the legal term aiding and abetting, right? So in, in, in the legal system, if you are charged with aiding and abetting, you are not the principal offender, right? You are not the main person involved in the crime, but you might do things to facilitate the crime, to cover up the crime, to allow the person, the criminal element to escape, right? things like that, aiding and abetting. So being an enabler is similar to that. So for example, there's someone in your life who is an alcoholic and you know the weakness of this person being an alcoholic and you leave alcohol lying around, you leave alcohol in their possession, knowing that they're trying to quit the habit, they're trying to break it, but you leave, you facilitate it. Or someone is a drug addict, and you leave the drugs lying around or you give them easy access to it or you encourage them to do it, right? Or if you have a teenager who is promiscuous or a teenager who is delinquent, a juvenile delinquent, and you, you don't put the measures in place to keep this teenager in check, you are aiding and abetting, you are enabling. Uh, there's, there was a particular student in my class and we, we, I was given a test. So, of course, you know the conditions of a test mean you are to do your own work. You are not to copy 
you're not a cheat. And this student, he had his paper with all the answers. And the student beside him was looking over in his paper. And he was is, is basically, he, he held his paper there for the other student to cheat. And I said to him, you are an enabler. You are enabling this person to cheat. You are just as bad. You're just as guilty. Because you're not putting anything, doing anything to stop this other student from doing something that you know is against the rules. And this same student also allowed himself because it's a situation where we had to bring in the parents and talk, bring in his, um, the persons who were in charge of him, his guardians, they weren't his parents, but his guardians to get to the root of this because he had some deep seated insecurities where he was doing things to appease the other students as, as part of being accepted by them. And so he was allowing himself to be posted as a watchman, right? So if, if they were doing things, let's say I'd stepped out of the classroom and they were doing anything that they know they weren't supposed to do, they post him there to see, okay, when is the teacher coming? Tell us when the teacher is coming. That kind of thing is enabling. And you should never allow yourself to be an enabler. In saying that though, I should add that there is a positive side to enabling, or I would say originally when we use the term enabler, for example, in, in the work setting, in the corporate setting, the, or, or a team player setting, the enabler would be a positive role. The, the, the enabler would play a positive role as a team leader who facilitates the cohesion of the team, facilitates um, the team members, each team member putting out their best, encouraging that kind of behavior in the team players so that as a group, the group succeeded, right? So there, it's not always a, a negative light, but the way that enabler has come now to mean is more negative than positive. In the negative sense, the enabler will make excuses for the persons. So, for example, in this case, that our discussion will take this morning where the women enable the bad behavior of men. There are women who will say, <clears throat> who will make excuses for men to say, well, men will be men. Boys will be boys. Men will cheat. They are men. They can't help themselves. They are going to cheat. They are going to whatever, um, we make excuses for them. Or an enabler might give the person resources, money, funding uh, to continue the, the bad behavior. Or the enabler might cover for these persons, right? Be an alibi for the person, lie for the person claim that the person was with you when you know they were elsewhere engaging in destructive behavior, negative behavior. Or the, the enabler might just ignore the bad behavior as a way of avoiding conflict. Sometimes we don't want to, we don't like confrontation. We don't want to be up in people's faces, uh, especially if it's something we have we have brought up before and it was not resolved. Or sometimes your family members are doing things and you know of it, but you don't report it. You don't confront them with it for fear of your own life as well. It can boil down to that. Not just for fear of verbal conflict, but the person can become physically abusive. So sometimes it's out of self-preservation why we enable if we know that the person is prone to violence or if we feel that our own lives might be at risk we might think twice about enabling and in jamaica we have a strong culture of the the, the, the um anti-snitch the, the snitch is a terrible thing to be especially in the inner city um you are looked down on if you bring 
if you turn someone in, if you give information that will lead to somebody's arrest, if you call out the person, you're a snitch, right? And nobody wants to be a snitch in the inner city, especially. So these are the kinds of things that we do. And in doing so, it enables the person to continue in the bad behavior. Now, as with most so-called sins, right? As with most sins, you have sins of commission and you have sins of omission. So as an enabler, there might be things that you do to facilitate the abuse of, of other women. And it might be things that you neglect to do that will cause other women to be at risk or to suffer abuse at the hands of men. So let's look at some of the things that we do as women. Let's look at some of the, the sins of commission, things that we do to facilitate the abuse of others, right? Um, is I heard someone say the other day, I was watching a video and the content creator she was saying men have a code men have a code a social code and women don't and i was wondering if that is true i, I'm, I still haven't decided but it's something to ponder and what she was talking about was the fact that and this is something i've seen in terms of the men they have a code among each other where even if they know the other man is in wrongdoing, they will cop he will cover for the other guy. So for example, if, if you have, so you're in a relationship, right? And your your male partner, he has a he has his male friends. If they see him out doing something that he's not supposed to do in terms of the, the fidelity in that relationship, they are not likely to call him out, they are not likely to tell you what he's doing. But if they see you as a female or if another female sees you, this is the clincher, you know. If another female sees you, she will, she will, she's likely to go to him and call you out. And, and his friends are likely to go to him and call him out and call, call you out on it. But they will protect each other as men. And it's an, it's an unspoken code. It's just understood. It's like they are born with this code to cover for each other, to protect each other as men. Women don't seem to have that, that understanding among them, that, 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 that shared heart between them or among them to cover for each other. I have, I have shared secrets on, on more than one occasion classified information shared secrets with women and they have gone back and revealed these secrets to men and to me that that to me that was like a sacrilegious thing to do right but it, it seems like a common thing among women where they just readily divulge crucial information, intimate information that other women confide in them. As a matter of fact, I heard a woman say once, um, anything you're telling me, you're automatically telling me and my husband, right? This is just something you should know. If you're telling me, you're automatically telling me and my husband. Would her husband say that? I am pretty sure that there are secrets that he has for his brothers, his, his, his clique, that he would never tell to his wife. But for her, she has no such code. She has no such loyalty to another woman. Once you tell me, when I'm with my man and we're in our pillow talk, he's going to know. He's because he's a part of who I am and we share everything. But does he have that same loyalty to you? I'm, I'm pretty sure he doesn't. There are things that he will hold sacred to him that other men have revealed to him. He will never tell another woman. So
So there is this strong code among men that does not seem to exist among women. And we fail to realize that in doing so, we are putting we are putting other women at. I myself am guilty of this. We are putting other women at risk, and sometimes these this the information that you give to a man about another woman it literally can put her life at risk. It can put her reputation at risk. It can really put her in harm's way. Uh, another sin of commission that is very rampant is the side chick behavior, right? Now, if you, as a woman, it's, it's one thing if you don't know, because we know that some men just don't reveal that they that they are in committed relationships already that they are in marriages they are married have their kids a stable home they don't reveal that a lot of men don't reveal that to the women that they are pursuing and she might find out later on that she's a side chick and she might decide to continue or she might decide to end it that's one thing but when you approach a man or the man approaches you and you are told that i'm in a stable relationship I'm, I'm married and then you decide that you're going to pursue this relationship you're going to knowing that this other woman more than likely doesn't know so the other woman at home, she more than likely doesn't know about you. He might divulge things about her that are intimate, that are that makes her vulnerable, but he's not going to tell her about you, right? Ultimately, you can become the proverbial home wrecker because when everything hits the, the, the fan, you know, the, her relationship can break. It can cause that relationship to break. It can cause the children to become um, victims of a broken home. It can wreck a marriage. And, uh, and some women take pride in being able to, to, to break up marriages. Some women, for them, it's a sense of pride that they are able to take your man, they are able to take your husband from you. To them, it's a, it's something to brag about because you know they have the good whatever and they have the good whatever to take your man from you. Not knowing that if he did this to her, more than likely he will do it to you. It's not always the case, but the kind of person who would do this to one woman is the same person who might end up doing it to you. There are exceptions, of course, but we're talking generally, right? So for you as a woman to deliberately become involved with a man and to ruin another woman's home, another woman's relationship, we have to take responsibility for it. As women, we have to ask ourselves, is this the right thing to do? Is this the noble thing to do? And um, call ourselves up. These are questions we have to ask ourselves. You know? We're all, in one way or another, guilty of some of these things that I'm going to be talking about, right? So whatever comes home to you as a woman, whatever you are guilty of as a woman, you need to own up to it and to ask yourself some serious questions. So those are the sins of commission. What are the, the sins of omission? What are some of the things that in not doing, we put another woman at risk of abuse? or put even ourselves at risk of abuse by not doing it. When you neglect to set boundaries, 
and what are boundaries? A boundary is something that you lay out to someone to say, we're not going to cross this line. These are things I will not accept. These are things that must be in place. So you draw the line and you let the person know, this is what it is. This is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I don't want. This is what I will not allow. When we neglect to set boundaries, we enable the person. And, and people generally will push the boundaries. They will test to see what they can get away with. Just like as we say, water seeks the lowest level. Most persons don't have the integrity within themselves to hold themselves up to a certain standard. Most persons will, will do just the, the minimum, the minimum that they can do to exist. The least that they can, that the least that you will allow them to do in terms of the, the positive, and they will do the most that you will allow them to do in terms of the negative. That that's just human nature. That just seems to be how humans operate. And it all boils down to ex expanding energy, right? We want to conserve energy. So if I can get X, Y, Z from you with just the minimum effort, I'm going to do it. That's how most people think. And if I can get away with X, Y, Z with you and still live in peace, I'm going to do it. So you have to know what the boundaries are for yourself and you have to set those boundaries in place and ensure that you enforce it with the people in your life. And the, this is not just your intimate partner, but in your work relations with your kids, there must be boundaries that we set. Now I can talk about Jamaican culture because this is where I'm from. This is what I know. I'm pretty sure it is the same in other cultures, but in Jamaica, we have a strong culture of turning a blind eye to incestuous relationship. Incest is something that, in my opinion, is rampant and we turn a blind eye to it. We pretend that we don't see what's happening as women, as mothers, grandmothers, aunties. We pretend that we don't know that this is happening in the family. And even when it is brought to light, we tell the girls to ignore it. Some of the grandmothers and mothers tell them, well, it happened to me and I'm all right so let him do it so when she come and say you know daddy is touching me up or daddy is is molesting me or grandpa is doing it or uncle is doing it or stepdad is doing it or even brother is doing it or cousin some of us as mothers and grandmothers and aunties we tell these young girls to bear it to grin and bear it because it happened to us and it's just a thing men do and some of these men in families, they feel entitled. They feel entitled to the bodies of the females in the family. Some fathers feel that because they provide, then they have the right to the first fruits. Some stepfathers coming in feel that they have the right to the first fruits. They are entitled to it. And some of us as women, we enable this, we allow this, and we turn a blind eye to it, and we do not protect our daughters and our little nieces and our granddaughters. We don't protect them. We throw them to the mercy of these savage men. This is a sin of omission. We are not the main perpetrators but we allow it for years and years and years we allow it and because there are benefits for us so because the father is providing and we don't want that those funds to dry up or we don't want uncle to go to prison we don't want grand, grand, grandpa to go to prison we don't want the family 
to come under scrutiny. We don't want the family to get a bad name. We don't want people to whisper. And so we hush. We tell the young girls to hush. Keep it on, on the wraps. We condone it and it is wrong. It is rampant and it is wrong. And we need to stop doing it as women. When our brothers and fathers go out sometimes and commit crimes, horrible crimes, and we know of it, especially in the inner city, we know of it. They come in with the bloody clothes that we wash. They come in with the weapons that we help to hide. They come in with the information that we help to cover up. And we lie for them. We provide alibis for them. We provide a safe place for them to hide out while they're keeping a low profile. We are aiders and abettors. We condone and we enable and we need to stop this snitch culture. We have to break it. This idea that if you're a snitch, you're the worst thing ever. We need to break it and stop condoning this behavior because we're putting our girls at, at risk. And these are the same girls who are going to become promiscuous because they have been deflowered too early and they know no other way. And in the promiscuous, promiscuity, they are going to become teenage pregnant mothers who cannot raise children, who cannot nurture children. And so it, the cycle continues with delinquent children being born and perpetrated in the society. Some women act as decoys. They act as accomplices to these crimes because they know that they will be seen as less um, dangerous. So they are, they are the ones who are sent out to lure people in. They are the ones who are sent out to enable these crimes. And women, we need to stop. I saw an article. I saw an article last week um, in the in the newspaper here in Jamaica, where this motorist, this female motorist, she was stopped on the road for a, a traffic violation, and you know she. I think there were four police officers, right? But one of them in particular, the, the gang leader, he encouraged her that, you know, she could she could pay some money and get out of the having to go to the traffic courts. And um, so eventually she agreed to do this. She was taken to the ATM machine and in the process of all of that, so she was actually sexually assaulted, right, as a result of this. They, when she went to the police station to make a report, there was a female constable on duty. And this female constable encouraged this woman to lie, encouraged her to lie on behalf of of, of the male constable who carried out the assault. The female constable on duty also gave false statements to her colleagues on behalf, trying to protect this unscrupulous, disgusting behavior of the male. So the male constable, he was charged with rape, grievous sexual assault, forcible abduction, corruptly soliciting, and simple larceny. All of these are serious charges. And yet another woman who was sworn to protect, right, who was sworn to enforce the law, encouraged this motorist, this female motorist, to lie for money and gave false statements to her colleague. Now you, something happened to another woman and you 
as a police officer, a female police officer, sworn to serve and protect the public. And here's another woman coming in to make a report that she was abducted, sexually assaulted, um, all manner of charges, five separate serious charges. And you as a woman, you're going to tell this 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 motorist, just just hush it, just quiet it down. Take take the money, take some money and hush it. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to bring it any further than this. And it's a culture that we have and we need to put a stop to it. We need to have some integrity in ourselves. When we get into these professions where we, are, we have to interact with the public and we are sworn to protect the interests of the public, particularly those who are most vulnerable. And let's face it, women are among the, more, the most vulnerable. Men are the ones who are more likely to commit violent crimes. Any violent crime you can think of, you will have vastly more men committing these crimes than women, whether it's rape, robbery, um, assault, theft, any serious crime you can think of, by far, it's the males who are more likely to commit them. This is not up for question. This is not up for debate. This is a fact. So women are vulnerable. And you as a woman, a female constable, a female police officer, you are going to encourage another woman who comes in to make a report, which, which in and of itself is a, is a brave thing because a lot of these crimes go unreported because the person is fearful of their, for their own lives. A lot of these crimes go unreported. So when someone has the courage to come in and say, this is what happened to me and I want to get some justice. And then you as a woman, you're going to tell her to hush. It's just, it's the same as what I've been saying. Within our families, within our families oftentimes it's the women who are telling the other women to hush right we have a culture also where the in-laws whether it's your mother-in-law your sister-in-law they condone the behavior so you might have you might be in a relationship with this guy and when you go around his family members, they embrace you, they welcome you. Oh, my, you're my sister-in-law, you're my daughter-in-law, right? They might be telling the same thing to five other women. They might be telling the same thing to five other women. Whenever he brings, whomever he brings to the, to the home to introduce within the same time and they know that you're in a relationship with this guy, with their brother or their son, and they will welcome them just the same. They'll call them their sister-in-law, their daughter-in-law, give them the same hospitality, tell them the same things that they tell you. And these are women who themselves are in relationships that they want to be monogamous, monogamous, they themselves are in relationships where they don't want their men to cheat on them. Yet they are facilitating their brother, their son, cheating on you. And then they smile with you when you come around. Right? This is hypocrisy. As women, we are being hypocrites to each other. You don't want it for you. Why would you encourage it to happen to another woman? And sometimes you, you don't want to interfere. And it, 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 you can't blame them sometimes because some of us as women, when people come to us and tell us things, we are, we are very quick to negate it. We are very quick to say, oh, you're just trying to mash up 
um, me and my man, you're just trying to mash up our relationship. You don't want the best for us. You're trying to ruin what we have, the good thing that we have. So I understand to a point why some people don't even want to interfere because some of us lock our minds when sisters try to help us. When people come to us and try to give us a, a, a heads up on the behavior of our men, a lot of times some of us flatly refuse. We don't want to hear it. Um, the other person is just being mischievous or, or just being um, wicked and want to mash up what we have. So on both sides of the fence, we need to do better. Keep your eyes open and keep your ears open. Be open to information. I'm not saying you should jump on everything you hear because there are people who are unscrupulous. There are people who will come with falsities. There are people who will want to wreck your good thing that you have and just sowing seeds of mischief, right? So you just have to be discerning. Don't shun the information. At the same time, don't be too quick to accuse people, especially if there is no evidence. We have to try to be balanced. We have to try to just have some common sense. Yeah, try to have some common sense and know within yourself that people are people. So don't be, don't put your neck on the block for anyone, for anybody, your, your spouse, your son, your dad, your coworker, your neighbor. Don't, don't think you know someone so much that you're, you're going to swear for them. You're going to put your neck on the block and swear, no, he would never. Don't do that. Don't do that. People are people. We are all prone to, to this. Um, we are all prone to, to, to error. We are all prone to do things that not even we expected to do. Life is just like that, right? We have indiscretions. We are all prone to them. And I'm not saying that everything is irredeemable either. Some things can be worked through. Some things can't be worked through. And for the ones that can't be worked through, we need to be honest enough and brave enough to move away from it, to step away from it, to drop it like hot putty, as we say in Jamaica, drop it like a hot putty and run. And we have to protect other females especially those who are minors. We have to protect the minors. There are certain professions. I know, I know for Jamaica, there are certain professions in which you are duty bound, duty bound, legally bound to report if you suspect not, eating, not you don't even have to have hard evidence. There are certain pro professions where once you suspect that a minor is being abused, you are legally bound to report it. And these are professions like teacher, social worker, nurse, doctor. But in some cases, even if you are the neighbor and you suspect that a minor is being abused, it is your obligation to alert the authorities. So there's a, there are legal obligations and then there are moral obligations, just as a person, just as, a, just as an individual. Don't do things that are going to put other people at risk. And this morning, our focus is women. So I'm speaking to the women as a woman, don't do things that are going to put other women at risk. Don't divulge information that, that is going to put another woman at risk in any way. Don't be the one who is going to deliberately wreck another woman's home or what another woman has built. 
no matter how enticing it is, no matter all the promises that are being made to you, is it worth wrecking what another woman has built? Put, put yourself in her place. Would you want someone to jeopardize what you have, have built? We all know that the onus is on the man because the other woman has no loyalty to you. It is he who should have the loyalty to you and it is he who should ensure that he protects that, right? But at the same time, you as a person within your integrity, you should consider yourself your sister's keeper. And, you know, a lot of us have been guilty of this in the past. We have done things, we have, and it all depends on where you are at in terms of your outlook on life and what you think is right and wrong. Some of us have been very free spirited and you know, for you it's, it's okay to be promiscuous. What other people describe as being promiscuous, that's fine by you, that's how you want to live. But the clincher for me is the fact that the other person doesn't know. That's the clincher that, that makes a difference. If you're going to be a swinger and you go among your other swingers and everybody knows that this is what we're doing, there's no issue. You're a consenting adult. You want to swing, you go and swing. You want to have your orgy, you go and have your orgy. You're consenting adults. But the, the thing is when the other person is oblivious to this and the other person might be allowing themselves to be exposed to certain things because they believe they are in a monogamous relationship. You are privy to the fact that you are privy to what's happening in her home. She's not privy to what's happening with you, right? So you are the, you are the side chick, you're the other woman. He's, he might tell you every detail of her life. He's not telling her anything about you. So you are in the position of power in that sense over her. And she might be exposing herself to things that she would not necessarily expose herself to if she knew. So for me, that is wrong. That, that behavior is wrong and it is putting another woman at risk. And we have to protect each other as women. We have to check ourselves as women. I, I, I was on another of my channels the other day and I was talking about um, the virtuous man, who can find a virtuous man. We always talk about for who can find a virtuous woman but where is the virtuous man and i was sharing i was sharing something that happened with me and my daughter we're, we're hiking up this hill so there's a hill in portmore that people hike very often in the mornings in the evenings you'll see dozens of people hiking up that hill and my daughter and i went up there one morning and it just so happened that when we got to the top of the hill, there were six men at the top of the hill. Usually when you get to the top, you might you know, do some exercise. You might look at the scenery because it's very beautiful. You can see everything on the plains. It's, it's really nice up there in the morning, the sun coming up. But because there were six men there, whether or not these men knew each other, there were six men. I immediately saw that as a threat. Immediately. It's like men have this threat of violence that they carry with them. And I said to my daughter, we're not going to tarry up here. Right? Because these men were there, we're not going to tarry. We're just going to turn and go straight back down. And on the way down, so I encountered two women going up. They weren't together, so one, one was ahead. But for both of these women, I remember stopping, and I said to them, there are six men up there, be careful. You need to decide whether you want to go up there or not, right? 
And I, I know that if it had been the other way around, if I had gone up there and seen six women, I would not have felt that threat for obvious reasons. And I would not have felt inclined to say to anyone, whether male or female, be careful, there are six women up there. I would, it would not have crossed my mind. But I saw where I needed to look out for these other women. I need them, needed to um, let them know that there was danger there. I mean, that of itself, the fact that six men are there and a woman cannot feel safe, that's a problem for me. We should be able to feel safe among our men. But the, the, the fact is that that's not the case right now. And I felt obliged as a woman to look out for these other women going up there and let them know that there is danger up ahead. It's sad, but it's just the reality. A friend of mine, she was, she was driving to me. She was actually coming to pick up her kids, right? And she told me that she was coming along the main road and she saw this other woman walking along the road. It, it was a lonely stretch of road. And she also saw this man parked in, in, in a vehicle and he, he just looked very suspicious. He, was, he had been driving around the scheme. So she had passed him earlier driving around the scheme. And then so she was coming back and he was there again and he looked suspicious to her just from his movements and everything. So she saw this woman walking and she, she pulled up beside the woman and she said, um, sis, do you need a lift? You need, you need a ride? Or for, because to her, she needed to protect this other woman. She needed to at least alert her that here was this man looking very predatory in, and, and moving like a predator, moving like someone who was up to no good. She felt obliged as a woman to stop and offer this other woman a ride. The other woman declined. She said she was just going, you know, just across the way, right? She may have also declined because she didn't feel safe going in a stranger's car either, right? So there are many things to consider here, but things like that, we have to look out for each other. We have to try to be alert and try not to just think of our own safety, but the safety of other women. We have to encourage other women. If we see another woman starting a business, we can support her. Encourage her, be a mentor to, to the girls, the young women coming up, be, be an inspiration to them, be something that they can aspire to set an example for them, show them that there is another way, show them that a woman can be independent. And in being independent, it's not like you're saying you don't need a man, you don't want a man, definitely not. I absolutely believe in relationships. I absolutely believe in marriage and having a strong foundation as a team. I think of male and female as a team. It's a partnership. It's not one higher than the other. It's a partnership where you might have strengths. The other person has strengths. So you have your weakness. They have their weakness. You complement each other. You build each other and support each other. So we need to know, we need as, as women who have gone ahead and, and blazed the trail, we need to pull our younger sisters up pull our daughters up, pull our students up. The female, my female students look up to me. And I, I take that very seriously and I try to be a stellar example for them to follow. I want to let them know that they don't have to come, come up thinking that they, they need to depend on a man to pay their rent, to buy things for them. They have to sit and wait on a man. You can do these things for yourself. You should meet each other on equal standing. So no one is dependent on the other. And if we are dependent, it's a codependence where we, we, we eke each other out, we support each other, we hold each other up. 
we should encourage these young women to stay focused and get their careers, establish themselves as independent entities who can stand on their own and who go into partnerships out of choice, not out of necessity, not out of desper desperation. So they are not vulnerable because men tend, if they have the upper hand, they tend to abuse it. It's just the way it is. Men abuse power. And if you come up thinking that you're going to rely on a man for everything to supply your needs, and some women take pride in this, that, that a man will keep them. Some women take pride in being a kept woman oh, my man can buy this, my man can do that, my man can fly me here and fly me there. But what is the trade-off? There's a trade-off. Are you willing to give up certain rights? Are you willing to be treated a certain way? You have to, you have to take these things into consideration. For me, it's always better to be an independent entity, to be able to stand on your own and if you're coming together, you both come together in power, in strength. That is how we must encourage our young sisters, our daughters, our cousins, our nieces, our female students, our female neighbors. This is how we must encourage them to be, come from a, power of a, a, a position of power encourage them to understand that being the side chick is no thing to be proud about it's nothing to be proud about being a home wrecker is nothing to be proud about causing pain to another woman causing an another woman to lose something that she has invested her time her resources, her, her nurturing into, for you to be the one to wreck that, that's nothing to be proud about. Enabling a man to be an abuser, enabling a man to be incestuous, enabling a man to take advantage of a woman in any way if you as a female facilitate a man to abuse another female in any way whether it's sexually physically emotionally any kind of way that's something to be ashamed of we must look out for each other as women we must protect and uphold each other and call out people who are going to take advantage of women, call out people who are going to try to abuse a woman in any way, on any part of the scale. In our families, we need to bring these predators to bear, call them out, tell them that they are wrong, if your brother is an abuser, tell him he is wrong. Don't smile with him. Don't let him think that you are okay with his behavior because you don't want another man to treat you that way, the way that your brother is treating your sister-in-law, the way that your son is treating his your daughter-in-law, the way your son, the way the way your dad is treating whomever. You don't want to be treated that way as a woman. So don't encourage it. Don't condone it. Don't smile with it. Don't tolerate it. Don't let this, people, this person think that you are okay. If you have to cut them off, cut them off. Let them know that you are not all right with this behavior. And is when we, we, well, this is, is when we put our feet down then the behavior is going to stop. This is when we're going to see changes. They're going to look into themselves. So don't keep saying, oh, boys will be boys. Men will be men. No. We, as, as women, 
we are the ones who we need to encourage good behavior in our men, in our brothers and sons and uncles. We need to encourage it. We are the civilizing force on the planet. Women are the civilizing force on the planet. We set the standard and we need to hold them to that. So it's, it's something that you must take seriously, right? Nurture good behavior in our homes. Don't let your son believe that he needs to be promiscuous in order to be a man. He must be running the streets, sowing his wild oats because he's a, he's a male. No. He is sacred too, just as your daughter is sacred and he needs to preserve and conserve his energy too. He needs to focus on his education too. Right now, the girls are passing the boys out by, by a mile and a half in terms of education. Because we encouraged our daughters to focus, stay in school, stay off the streets, but we let the boys run the road and, and, and not focus on their education. And now we have this huge gap, this abyss, this abysmal gap in, in education. The girls, the women, as old as they can be, are, are blazing ahead in education and the boys are lagging behind, the men are lagging behind. Because we told our girls, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to stay disciplined, stay in school, stay this, and we allowed the boys to run rampant and now this is what we have on our hands. So we have to let our boys know that it is okay to preserve and conserve yourself too. It's not okay to abuse another person's daughter. And, and you wouldn't want the same for your sister. Or, or when you grow older, you're not going to want the same for your daughter. Why would you want to do it to somebody else's daughter? When you're running the street, is somebody else's daughter you're doing it with. So, you know, ultimately it boils down to um, just not being selfish. You see, if, if, if we could all follow that premise of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, this, this world would be a better place. And for all of you who say you're religious, that tenet is in all the religions. In different words, but it's there. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let us follow that and this world will be a better place. Don't allow to be done to another woman what you wouldn't want to be done to you as a woman. So I'm talking to the sisters, I'm talking to the mothers, I'm talking to the grandmas, don't allow something to happen to another woman that you wouldn't want to happen to you as a woman. So let us hold ourselves up, confront each other, confront yourself, ask yourself some serious questions. Am I an enabler? Do I enable the bad behaviors of men in any way? And if you do, you need to stop. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll discuss another very serious and relevant topic. So until then, this is Kamal. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for your company. And I'll see you next week.